Welcome to the 2023 World Ovarian Cancer Coalition Partner Meeting Session on low-grade serous ovarian cancer. Today's panel discussion is a follow-up session to the 2022 Rare Ovarian Cancer Session at the Partner Meeting. My name is Nicole Andrews and I'm board chair of Star Ovarian Cancer and I'm serving as today's moderator. There have been many positive developments in LGSOC over the past 12 months and it seemed important to take the time today to reflect on these. Listening to last year's session, one specific item that stood out to me from what Dr. David Gershenson mentioned on how patient advocacy organizations could partner with our research community around helping organizations such as National Cancer Institute and the U.S. Food and Drug Administration to learn patient needs and perspectives. So earlier this year, I asked Dr. Gershenson for a meeting to help me better understand his meaning. My takeaways from our meeting were that rare tumor studies were difficult to get through approvals, and there was a sense that agencies did not understand the patient needs and perspectives about living with the rare cancers. And finally, it was important that patient voices be heard. Today, we will share with you how STAR, Cure Ovarian Cancer, World Ovarian Cancer Coalition, the LGSOC Research and Industry partnered together to solve some of these issues. Today's session's objectives are, one, to share with all of you the key developments from this year, two, to discuss what we learned about the experiences of those living with LGSOC and their needs, priorities, and three, what we see as next steps as a result of the collaborative projects and initiatives the community completed. I'd like you all to meet our panel for today. So panel members, after I call on each of you, please introduce yourself saying, who you are and your interest and work in low-grade serous ovarian cancer. All right, let's start with Jane. Hi, my name's Jane Ludeman. I'm from New Zealand and I'm the founder of Cure Our Ovarian Cancer. I founded Cure Our Ovarian Cancer after my diagnosis with low-grade serous ovarian cancer six years ago to uh, help increase the amount of research on low-grade serous ovarian cancer and the information available for people living with this disease. We've since expanded to become New Zealand's national ovarian cancer charity, but with a strong focus on low-grade serous ovarian cancer. And we support research on low-grade serous across five countries around the world. Thank you, Jane. All right, next, Dr. Gershenson. Thanks very much, Nicole. So I'm David Gershenson, a professor and former chair of the Department of Gynecologic Oncology and Reproductive Medicine at the University of Texas MD Anderson Cancer uh, Center in Houston, Texas. I've had a longstanding interest in rare ovarian cancers and over the last couple decades, focusing mostly on uh, serous borderline tumors and low-grade serous ovarian cancer. All right, thank you, Dr. Gershenson. We also have with us today, Dr. Sun. Dr. Sun, would you introduce yourself? Hi, Nicole. Hi, everyone. My name is Charlotte Sun, and I'm an associate professor in research in the Department of Gynecologic Oncology and Reproductive Medicine, MD Anderson Cancer Center in Houston, Texas. I have a, a strong interest in low-grade serous ovarian cancer, uh, particularly because of some of the uh, distinct uh, treatment um, implications and uh, quality of life impacts on the patients with this rare disease. Thank you, Dr. Sun. And finally, Clara. Clara, would you say a short bit about your work and involvement with LGSOC? And do. So I'm Clara McKay. Um, thank you so much, Nicole, for agreeing to moderate this session today. I'm very, very pleased by that. So I'm Clara. I'm CEO of the World Ovarian Cancer Coalition, and we are a network of about 200 patient advocacy organizations worldwide. Um, the thing that we share in common is a commitment to ensuring that every woman, everyone diagnosed with ovarian cancer has the best chance of survival and the best quality of life possible, no matter where they live. And the, the key words are every woman, really. And we take a, I think we feel a particular responsibility to uh, highlight areas where we see there is unmet need globally and low-grade serous ovarian cancer certainly uh, falls into that uh, uh, bucket. Thank you, Clara. And thank you all of you for um, being with us today for our session. All right, for those of you joining who are not 
as familiar with low-grade serous ovarian cancer, or as we often say, LGSOC, I thought I could briefly share just some key points about low-grade serous ovarian cancer. So low-grade is um, clinically, histologically, molecularly um, distinct from high-grade, which is a more common um, form of epithelial um, cancer. Um, it represents less than 10% of the, the epithelial um, ovarian cancers. Um, another um, bit of information is um, we have been told that about 90% of the patients are Caucasian. There is an 80% um, of the patients diagnosed are diagnosed at advanced stages, stage three and higher. Um, there's a higher rate of relapse with um, the numbers being around 80%. Some key differences um, that are known about low grade and high grade um, compared to high grade um, is that low grade is relatively insensitive to chemotherapy. It disproportionately affects younger women, median age being 45. It's also um, has a prolonged um, compared to um, high grade um, overall survival with um, you can correct me on this. Um, Dr. Gershenson, I think it's 135 to 150 months. Um, finally, some challenges and considerations about low grade um, is that there's um, concern with fertility um, preservation because of the younger women that um, are affected. Um, and then um, currently there are no FDA approved therapies specific for low grade um, serous ovarian cancer. So did I, did I leave anything out that we need to share with our community, Dr. Gershenson? No, that was a, that was a great summary, Nicole. All right. You've been a good teacher. <laughs> um, okay, so let's start our conversation um, about the consensus statement. So as I mentioned earlier, um, we're going to cover a, a number of developments that have occurred over the last year or so, including the RAMP 201 study, as well as the results from the low-grade serous ovarian cancer patient impact survey that was completed earlier this year. Um, I do want to kick off our discussion with a few words about this publication um, that happened. It was the Low Grade Experts Consensus Report, and it was published in July of this year. So I was part of the expert group that met in New York regarding the consensus report. Jane um, here today was very instrumental, um, and I worked with her, and we presented the patient perspective at the meeting. And of course, Dr. Gershenson was a part of the expert um, group planning the meeting, um, being you know, um, involved at the meeting and of course, writing the report. So I want to start off with um, asking a question to you, Dr. Gershenson. Um, could you say a few words about the objectives of convening the expert group and producing this report? And, and also, if you could just su summarize some key areas of consensus. Yes, th thank you very much. Yeah, as a little bit of background, in 2019, we held the initial uh, International Consensus Conference on Low-Grade Serous Ovarian Cancer. And that was, uh, those were the findings were published in the journal, Gynecologic Oncology. But, uh, you know, it's been about three years since that uh, report. And we thought in the intervening time, a number of advances had occurred in terms of the information related to uh, low-grade serous ovarian cancer, particularly related to some clinical trials, and we wanted to be able to update clinicians and patients on the latest uh, advances in the field. Uh, so in October of 2022, we again convened a panel of international experts, and we met for a whole day in New York. And uh, as you've already mentioned, the findings from that conference were published this past July in terms of uh, uh, I think, advances in the basic translational and clinical aspects related to low-grade serous carcinoma. So to highlight, highlight just a few of the statements, so the first one was that I'd like to mention is that in the last couple years, uh, two phase three clinical trials uh, using MEK inhibitors have been published, the MILO trial and the GOG-281 trial. And in that, uh, with that experience, as well as looking at the genomic data from low-grade serous carcinoma in publications that have occurred over the last year, we have found that um, patients whose tumors have a alteration in the MAP kinase pathway, 
So a KRAS, a BRAF, an NRAS, an HRAS mutation may have a greater response uh, and greater response rate to MEK inhibitors. Uh, it was 26% response rate in the GOG-281 trial and 24% in the MILO trial. And, uh, but however, I think the consensus conference was in agreement that we really don't know what the optimal biomarker is for uh, response to a MEK inhibitor. Is it just KRAS? Is it the whole panel of MAP kinase mutations? So that was one important uh, question that we tried to address. A second question was that we uh, was related to the ideal biomarker for response to endocrine therapy, which is the other really um, effective therapy in many patients with low-grade serous carcinoma. And we were in agreement that there we don't know what the optimal biomarker for endocrine therapy is. We know that about 95% of women with low-grade serous carcinoma have a positive estrogen receptor, but to date, there's been no correlation of the estrogen receptor with response to therapy. Thirdly, uh, we found out over the past few years that uh, low-grade serous ovarian cancer is not part of the hereditary ovarian cancer syndrome. So only about 4 to 5% of women with low-grade serous ovarian cancer have a BRCA mutation, either a BRCA1 or BRCA2 mutation. So it's really not part of that. And we don't really very well understand the genesis and the pathogenesis of uh, low-grade serous ovarian cancer. You mentioned fertility sparing surgery and fertility. Many of our patients, particularly those with early stage disease, are considering fertility preservation with the preservation of one ovary and uterus. Uh, many of them are having a in vitro fertilization with oocyte cryopreservation or embryo cryopreservation and subsequent fertility. So that's an important aspect because the patients with low-grade serous carcinoma have an average age of about 45 compared to high-grade serous carcinoma where the average age is about 63. So fertility is of much greater concern to this patient population. Finally, I'll mention uh, just a couple of things related to therapy. So for primary therapy, we know that we believe there are two standard approaches right now. Uh, one of them is chemotherapy with paclitaxel carboplatinum, followed by letrozole maintenance therapy. And the other is letrozole monotherapy without prior chemotherapy. And of course, both of these are following primary cytoreductive surgery. We don't know which one is better or if they're equivalent. And so there is a, an ongoing clinical trial, NRG GY019, that is comparing these two strategies to determine if one is better than the other or they're equivalent. And the prospect for this is we may be able to abandon chemotherapy altogether in the frontline treatment of low-grade serous ovarian cancer. And then finally, for relapse, we were in agreement in the conference that there is no standard sequencing of therapies for relapse. You've already mentioned that there are no FDA-approved drugs for the treatment of low-grade serous ovarian cancer. We have borrowed from uh, therapies for HR-positive breast cancer and from ovarian cancer in general. And we've learned a lot over the last decade, and we now know that two of the more effective therapies are either endocrine therapies or uh, MEK inhibitors or other targeted therapies, BRAF inhibitors, or maybe some combinations. So those were among some of the highlights of the consensus conference. Talk to me, if you can, about the, um, like the important developments of these type of consensus um, um, items. Like, why are these important? Well, I think... From you, and you'll maybe hear that we'll maybe hear this a little bit more when we talk about the patient impact survey. You know, I think a lot of patients are frustrated that their healthcare providers don't understand enough or know enough about uh, low grade serous ovarian cancer. This relates to OBGYNs, primary care physicians. And so, one of the important objectives is to try to educate healthcare providers 
about more about rare cancers like low grade serous ovarian cancer. And that's it's a challenge because medicine is the, the information explosion has really created so much new new technology, new information. And so it is a challenge. And uh, likewise, we want to try to educate women about about this disease. And so they can be more cognizant uh, of the potential symptoms, which may be vague. And uh, we found out from the patient survey that um, a number of women, like 80%, had uh, a delay in their diagnosis of up to three years. So that's a, that's huge. Absolutely. Jane, does, did anything stand out in this report for you that you felt like was especially noteworthy? Uh, yes, thank you so much for that, Nicole. I think um, it was just really exciting as a whole to see that the progress that is being made and the understanding compared to when that initial report uh, and meeting took place in 2019. But what I think is is really special in this report that's already been touched on is just the inclusion of that patient experience. And I think it really, it's quite unique as far as I'm aware in, in academic papers. And it really shows that regard and respect that the researchers and medical experts working on low-grade serous ovarian cancer have for their patients and uh, that respect for their uh, expertise as people with a lived experience of that disease. So it was really special to see our words written down alongside the words of the medical experts and being given sort of equal equal um, placement. Mm. Thank you. And and I'm going to dive a little deeper um, uh, and, and ask you another question, um, Jane. Um, also within the report, were there areas or issues that you felt should be prioritized as we move forward? Yes. Well, I think um, it's really important that uh, this information is really widely available. But the one thing that struck me is something where we have all the information because I guess there's a lot of areas where we need to know more and we need to progress that. But I thought it was really good that recommendation around clinical trial participation and actually saying that we don't need to be requiring women with low-grade serous ovarian cancer to have had chemotherapy specifically to participate in a clinical trial because um, it's recognizing that recommendation that there are women out there, there are other systemic therapies that people are taking that are not chemotherapies. And I know you'll be aware in terms of in the support groups that that's often a cry that people who haven't had chemotherapy yet sometimes end up taking it, not because they necessarily, if anyone thinks it's the best next therapy for them, but because it's something they have to take to then be able to participate in a clinical trial and so I think it would be really good uh, and I know a lot of people in our community would be really excited if that requirement could be removed in the future. Absolutely yeah we hear a lot about that don't we from the the support group is um, that there is an outcry about that. Um, thank you for sharing that um, Jane. Um, Dr. Gershenson, you mentioned um, about wanting to do a report um, and, and promoting having a report for healthcare providers, patients. Um, what do we need to do about promotion? And what do you all feel like is being done? You you hit on a lot of areas. Um, so uh, the gynecologist, the um, you know oncologist, um, just you know, healthcare providers, patients, how do we promote to all of this, this variety of um, stakeholders? Well, I think, I think it's a multifaceted approach. I, I think there's not one, one way to do it. And I also would, again, re, you know, reiterate that it is a somewhat of an uphill battle because uh, healthcare providers have so much they need to know. But I think we do it through uh, scientific pub, uh, presentations at national meetings. And more and more, th these scientific presenta presentations are receiving press releases, international press releases that go into the, to, to the media. 
And I think the public begins to become aware of them. Uh, healthcare providers pay more attention to them. So a lot of it has to do with marketing, uh, uh, quite honestly. But, you know, through scientific meetings, consensus conference, uh, those are all good things. I would also put in a plug uh, related uh, to what's already been said, and that is international collaboration. You know, in medicine, so much of the time, healthcare providers, physicians, investigators compete with each other. And, and a lot of times that can be, become unhealthy. And so a few years ago, actually Jane's family and Jane decided to uh, start an international uh, consortium. And so we did uh, begin to organize the International Consortium for Low-Grade Serous Ovarian Cancer with about initially 15 or so uh, scientists and physicians uh, from several countries, including Australia, New Zealand, Canada, the US, UK, France. And we're going to be uh, building on the membership of that group. And I think the more we can do things like that and develop clinical, international clinical trials, international uh, translational research studies, that's the way we're going to make progress. Uh, so that's that's a major focus, as well as the challenge of educating healthcare providers, particularly. Okay, as part of the Coalition Partners Program Clinical Update Series, there's a recorded segment with Dr. Susanna Banjari, uh, Banerjee <laughs> um, on RAMP 201, the interim data, uh, where the study goes from here. So we'll share some of Susanna's observations um, in a minute, and I encourage everyone to view this full update outside of our session. Jane, before we delve into the development and its significance, I wonder if you could share your thoughts about whether you think overall we are seeing more positive trend in growth in research investment um, into LGSOC trials um, studies. Uh, thank you so much for that, Nicole. I am not so sure about the investment per se, but in regards to are we seeing progress? Uh, definitely. When I look back to when I was diagnosed six years ago compared to today, there are so many more clinical trials happening, though it's still, we need more and there's still an issue in terms of people being able to access them. There's a lot more evidence for the protocols that are being used in low-grade serous ovarian cancer as well. And there are emerging treatments that weren't being talked about when I was diagnosed, which is, is really incredible. And I think a lot of the reasons for this uh, in a large part come down to the efforts of the researchers working in the space where there, we, we certainly need more of them that the people who are working in the space have been really committed and have been working for a long time. And I think we're just getting to a point where there's more and more momentum in this effort that they've you know, put decades of work into is really starting to be a fruit. And we're also seeing within the patient community that there's a really exciting change happening there too with, um, for example, building on, there was some initial effort, but then with cure ovarian cancer and through your efforts with star ovarian cancer and other women with low-grade serous working through other organisations uh, just to really push that research and change through both in terms of funding research but also putting their stories into the media to gain that profile and supporting each other through the low-grade serous ovarian cancer peer support group on Facebook and so it's it's an awful disease but I think we have the best people and it's really beautiful to see how the community of women with this rare disease how we have been able to band together and create and push for change and I do think it's quite exciting I think in the next year or two potentially Star and Cure Ovarian Cancer collectively might hit a um, million dollars of research funded and that's really all come from the community of women with this rare disease and their family and friends so uh, yeah there is a lot of um, momentum happening and we really want to increase that momentum and bring on as many other people to support this because it is a really high need disease that, that needs progress. And so it is nice to see the changes that are happening. 
Right. Thank you. Dr. Gershenson, could you briefly share why there's excitement about the RAMP study in terms of what it means for women with low-grade serous ovarian cancer? Yes. So the phase two RAMP study, RAMP 201, does certainly, uh, the preliminary findings are very promising. You know, again, going back to the MILO trial had a 24% response rate, um, and it had uh, the uh, GOG 281 had a 26% response rate. And in both of these trials, we found that women who had an alteration in the MAP kinase pathway, so KRAS in the MILO trial, and then the KRAS, BRAF, or NRAS in the GOG 281 trial, had a greater probability of responding to a MEK inhibitor than women who did not have those alterations in their tumor tissue. Um, the, but so we found like in uh, Milo, if they had an alteration in KRAS, there was a 44% response rate. If they did not, it was 19%. In GOG, GOG 281, if they had an alteration, it was 50% response rate. And if they did not, it was actually around 10%. So in the RAMP trial, their overall confirmed uh, objective response rate is 45%. And it was higher in women who had a, had a KRAS mutation, 60%, versus 29% in women who were wild type KRAS. Uh, so the, you know, we have to, these, these uh, results are preliminary. They're based on rather small numbers. And so while they're promising, we have to kind of look with caution as to whether this really is going to represent uh, an advance over the other MEK inhibitors or not. It could. And, and uh, it's particularly interesting to me, the response rate in women whose tumors do not have an alteration in, in KRAS. That may be the uh, place where this these drugs, the defactinib plus the uh, RAF MEK inhibitor have a, have a real role. I'd like to share now some reflections from um, Dr. Banerjee on the challenges of undertaking studies of this kind in rare diseases like LGSOC and why having a genuinely global approach is important. And, and you, you've touched on uh, the, the international global nature of, of these the studies. Um, how, how important is global collaboration when it comes to addressing upmen, upmen needs for, for patients in in this particular space? It's essential. Um, so in particular with rare forms of cancer. Um, and so we describe that in low-grade serious ovarian cancer. So if we are going to improve treatment options, we need enrollment into clinical trials. And it's not possible to do that from one country or a few countries in a rare condition. And um, cancer has no boundaries. Uh, it's a global disease. and and um, therefore um, uh, patients being, having been able to be enrolled um, in individual countries is really important. Um, also thinking about distance to travel, um, uh, and I appreciate the complexities of trial sites opening in rare conditions, but I, I know too well that many patients will travel across an individual country um, to, to access um, entry into clinical trials. So, you know, it's essential. And also we need to learn uh, or have the opportunity to learn if there are differences um, between um, uh, patients in different countries, different ethnicities, for example, uh, in terms of um, uh, the amount of benefit patients derive from individual treatments. So that's across clinical trials, um, I would say. Fantastic. And ju just on that point of global collaboration, do you feel it that is genuinely global or is is it perhaps still very much a case of uh, higher income, middle income countries that that dominate the space when it comes to patients being involved in these clinical trials? Do you think there there needs to be something done about that in some way, if that if that is the case? So, so I'm, I'm, I'm very pleased to be the um, uh, co-chair of the GCIG, that's the Gynae Cancer intergroup um, trials in rare cancer specifically. Um, so, and I've been part of the group attending this meeting for a number of years, and I can see the, that it truly is a global effort. 
you know, there is there certainly is recognition of where trial enrollment has has been traditionally um, and the need to expand beyond this. And this is happening. We saw this, I know, a different condition, but we saw this um, in trials of cervical cancer and endometrial cancer reported this year um, at ESMO 2023 that um, uh, there, there, there is increased global recruitment um, for these conditions beyond um, the uh, traditional countries like the US and certain European countries. So it's important to retain that, and in, in, but increase recruitment. Um, and that is in the hands, of course, of our sponsors, um, which, um, you know, for example, this trial is a pharmaceutical uh, company, but there is recognition across the board um, of the need to open um, across countries. Um, and hand in hand, there needs to be the infrastructure to um, recruit to clinical trials and support patients so that the data um, is um, useful and safety for our patients um, across opening new centres within existing countries, but also new countries. And I think that's really important. This is a question for all of you. To Dr. Banner um, G's point, how do we make sure that globally people who are diagnosed with low-grade serous ovarian cancer have access to clinical trials? I'd start. We, we've, um, and I've probably talked about this before, but we are doing uh, quite a significant piece of work around ovarian cancer and the experiences of women with ovarian cancer in 24 middle to low to middle income countries. And we are working, we work uh, doing the study in partnership with the International Gynecologic Cancer Society. And one of the things that we've really learned from this study is firstly, there's a huge appetite and interest in, in research and clinical trials, both from the perspective of patients, um, but probably most loudly from the perspectives of clinicians who are kind of working at the coalface or in academic institutions. And I think what, you know, there is a, an interest and I think there is a genuine international will to address this challenge. Um, and as we know, about 70% of all cases of ovarian cancer are are in low and middle income countries. So 70% so of the overall ovarian cancer population really is not being well served and, and not, you know, not for lack of commitment. But I think Susanna's points were really fair about the need for an infrastructure. And this is a global, you know, it's a global problem and it isn't, it isn't for low grade serous ovarian cancer community to solve, but we have to be part of it too. We need infrastructure. Uh, and that requires being innovative about ways to bring clinical trials to countries that, you know, just haven't participated before. And, and that's about working with academic institutions, it's about mentoring. It's about being really innovative about how clinical trials can be run in um, places where they've not been before. Or there's not a culture. Um, and we need information. You know, patients and clinicians need to understand the importance and value of clinical trials and health ministries and governments um, and collaboration, much as, you know, we've talked about here. So I think those points are really important. And then from a, you know, a, a kind of practical perspective, uh, Susanna mentioned transport. That is possibly, and I would argue, even in higher income countries, for many patients, the getting to the center where the clinical trial is that they need is a real challenge. And if you do have transport, you might not have childcare or you might not be able to afford the parking fees, which are often, you know, quite, quite significant. So I think, I think Susanna touched on some really important points and I, and, and as the, as the world of Varian Cancer Coalition, it's something we feel very passionate about because we do feel every woman, every woman deserves the right to have access to a trial. Yeah, I think the advances in this area are incremental. They are challenging. Um, you know, the person through the personalized therapeutics arm of the International uh, Consortium for Low Grade Serious Ovarian Cancer, we're we're working with a group called GCAR, which is a global uh, uh, consortium that helps uh, facilitate international clinical trials, and we will be uh, developing uh, several. Uh, trials uh, within the context of a platform trial 
uh, for women with low-grade serous ovarian cancer. And we just had a meeting today about that, and we're going to be meeting with the FDA in the very near future and hopefully can launch uh, the first trial within this platform in the next uh, few months. That's brilliant. That's excellent. That's what we need. We need more of that. Let's move on. So a final area of discussion. Um, let's turn to insights from the experts that know the most about low-grade serous ovarian cancer, the women. Um, to kick off this, I'd like to bring Dr. Sun, who um, has been part of um, a global advisory group this year that um, also includes the panelists um, that are um, with us today. And this um, advisory group oversaw a survey of 186 women with low-grade serous ovarian cancer um, over the summer. And this important initiative was supported by Veristem Oncology, and they helped us um, um, get this um, survey um, funded. Um, so Dr. Sun, would you share with us some of the key findings from this amazing work and the significance of this survey? So as Nicole was saying, this um, survey was developed with um, participation of everybody on the committee. Um, and the goal of the survey was to assess uh, the patient knowledge and understanding of low-grade serous ovarian cancer, including the emotional and physical burdens and impact of the disease, the economic and financial burden of um, being treated, diagnosed, and um, you know, ongoing uh, surveillance of the disease, as well as, well as um, the key barriers to managing uh, low-grade serous ovarian cancer. The survey was launched uh, through well-publicized efforts uh, via social media, email, newsletters, and websites from the patient advocacy groups. It was made available uh, for a month during the summer, and it took approximately 15 minutes to complete this online survey. The respondents were a total of 186 women, ages 18 and older, representing multiple countries listed here, the United States, the United Kingdom, Canada, New Zealand, Australia, France, Italy, Spain, Germany, among some other countries. So it was a wide representation, a very good response rate for um, being open only for a few weeks. Um, so the in, this is the results from the um, patient impact survey. Um, reflecting low awareness and knowledge um, among those women who are diagnosed. 99% had never heard of LGSOC before they were diagnosed. Um, and over half of the women, 65%, said that if they had known more about LGSOC, they feel they would have been diagnosed sooner. And only one in four are satisfied with the amount of um, current information out there. So the um, the journey to being diagnosed can be excruciatingly long. Um, the average amount of time that passed before uh, patients were diagnosed from the onset of symptoms, um, according to the women who uh, took the survey, was three years. Um, and more than two in three um, stated that it was a difficult and frustrating path. 59% were not satisfied with how long it took to be diagnosed. Um, almost 70% said that their symptoms uh, were attributed to another health condition. 66% uh, felt like their symptoms were dismissed by their healthcare provider initially. We can go to the next slide. There's a significant amount of emotional impact um, and challenges with the treatment uh, for low-grade serous ovarian cancer, predominantly uh, Living with the uncertainty, not knowing what the path is, uh, was noted by 68% of the women. 60% uh, were um, said the biggest challenges included limited treatment options. And I think Dr. Gershenson had touched upon that earlier. Um, over half of the women, 52%, um, said their biggest challenge was um, dealing with some of the side effects um, that treatment had uh, dealt them. And almost 50% uh, dealt with a significant amount of anxiety or worry. 41% said that their lives revolved around or felt like their lives revolved around their, um, their disease. 90%, um, I think this is very interesting, 90% felt like they were getting quote unquote treatment leftovers instead of treatment regimens that had been specifically approved and studied for low-grade serous ovarian cancer. 
and one quarter of the women reported having to stop their treatment because of side effects. Um, and that's where we start to see the quality of life being balanced out with potential benefit, therapeutic benefit of a treatment. That underscores the importance of getting the patient's um, experience. Um, so only 42% said they were satisfied with the available resources for uh, women like themselves. And 88% strongly agree that uh, they wish that more attention was being given to low-grade serous ovarian cancer, setting it aside from the more common high-grade serous ovarian cancer. And the very, uh, the, the most important item that people wanted other women to know about was that the symptoms can be easily misdiagnosed as something else. These symptoms initially are very vague and can be attributed to, to multiple conditions and to be sent to different specialists to chase down various symptoms um, can be very stressful. And um, we just talked about transportation as being a logistic barrier that can be very frustrating as well. Next slide. Thank and so you, the, Dr. Sun. Yeah, I was just gonna say the Patient Impact Advisory Committee is represented by all these people here and they came up with the questions and uh, look forward to meeting with them in the future. I do too. Thank you, Dr. Sun, for um, sharing um, those amazing key findings from the work, this amazing work. Did anything stand out for you in these results about quality of life that might be unique for women with low-grade serous ovarian cancer? I think one of the things is the uncertainty. Unlike some of the other cancers, particularly the high-grade serous ovarian cancers where um, there are treatments available for recurrences. Um, there are now maintenance therapies that are now available. Not as much is known about the pathway the, of treatments available for, for women with uh, low-grade serous ovarian cancer, and therefore the access to the clinical trials is most important uh, for these ladies. The other thing is that um, fertility and the impact on the other part of a woman's life that struck me as um, very notable. Um, so I, because this, this um, particular form of ovarian cancer tends to impact women who are slightly younger and might be in the midst or have not even started um, with their own families yet, this is a significant trauma maybe just as much so as the original diagnosis. And this is something that we cannot ignore. Thank you for mm -hmm. saying that. And um, we as patient advocacy organizations, um, myself, Clara, Jane, hear this, he, he, exactly um, that significance um, as being so vital. And it's nice to have the information that, that we now know from a study um, a, a research yes. study that that helps support what we hear, um, and, and that's um, so significant. Jane, was there anything in the results from the research that surprised you, or does this work validate your own um, experience, research, um, and understanding of the experiences of women with low grade? Like, what stands out to you? I think what really what really surprised me from the study was was that three years average that it was taking people to get diagnosed and that certainly reflects my personal experience but I know reading in the literature when you look at ovarian cancer as a whole what's been published has suggested that for ovarian cancer as a whole that timeline is much less and just you know an average time to diagnosis of three years uh, I know personally just how incredibly traumatic that is to keep going back and forth and back and forth to your clinicians and I think it's something that when you do get the diagnosis it's it's a lot to work through because it does really undermine your trust in the medical profession but also I think it says because this is one of you know one of the more common rare ovarian cancers that gets diagnosed at quite a late stage and there can be a sense of inevitability with that but I think when you're looking at three years you know if 
if we could get that down to three months, conceivably there is um, just by doing some of those real basics well if 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 countries were in terms of educating women on the symptoms and having good guidelines and medical professionals being able to access the necessary tests and not dismissing women based on their their age and other factors then potentially it's another way that we could be improving outcomes for low-grade serous ovarian cancer I certainly think the treatment side of things is the most important to focus on, but it does show that some of those bread and butter things could potentially make a difference to people. Uh, so I think that's um, one of the really important things that I noted from it that just really stood out to me. Uh, the other thing was just, uh, and it was, I'm sure you found it too, it was a really hard watch because there's a lot of, a lot of trauma and I think all the women who participated in these surveys and who shared their experiences in the FDA meeting just so brave and everyone's experience is different but I think there is there is a commonality in the, in the trauma through it and although you know we're all as people so much more than our cancer uh, and we have lots of other things and hobbies and interests and family and friends and careers and, and other things in our lives uh, but this is a part of our life and I think it can sometimes feel like when you're diagnosed particularly if you're not receiving chemotherapy you look the same and externally you don't change but it's something that the clinicians really need to be mindful of and organizations who are dealing with women with this cancer because there's certainly a lot of really incredibly intelligent capable and passionate women with this disease um, but we have had to expand our lives to deal with these other things that are going on in the surface and so I think you know no one wants to be patronized to but having understanding and compassion uh, that there is a lot of stuff going on under the surface as well and I think as hard as it was to watch there was something incredibly powerful about a community just standing up and speaking and saying this is our experience this is what's happening and so I really yeah really applaud everyone who took part in it. I agree with you. Um, Clara, why is it important to have this kind of evidence? Like, how does it help the community do more, do better? Um, and then if you'll even just share a, a bit about, like, who needs to be made aware of this study? And, and um, in a way that helps us drive change. So I think it's incredibly important to do this work and it is hard to see and hard to hear. It's painful really. And, and I take Jane's point about trauma. You can, you experience the trauma through the results of this survey. And I too was really struck by that 90% of women feel they're just getting some leftover treatment because that's, you know, that sort of speaks about how we value individuals and, 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 and individual diseases and the, the importance of them. But but I think going back to a point that we started with quite at, at right at the beginning from David about <clears throat> evidence, about taking this out, about standing on platforms at international meetings, in journals, you know, communicating this to a really important audience of clinicians and researchers and advocates. But also, I think communicating this through more populist means so that women here, you're not alone that there is a community that cares very deeply about you and that you can see your experience in and who want to do more and do better. And so I think it's partly about using evidence to drive really you know, important practical changes, challenging, challenging you know, assumptions and understandings of the importance of a disease and people's experiences, putting forward, you know, concrete ideas about what we can do to address the issues that have, have been made, but also about sharing more broadly with the world the importance of doing something for this disease and the fact that people do care and are committed and are working as hard as they can and are there to support you. Um, if we could, let's finally um, spend a couple of minutes sharing some insights from the recent Voices of LGSOC meeting. So I wanted to share the meeting, um, just a little background about 
that it held importance for patients. It held importance for the FDA, for researchers, industry, patient advocacy organizations. We do have a brief segment that we want to share from the meeting during um, this, the panel discussion part of the meeting, where the women were asked specifically what we should be looking for in future treatments. So we're going to share that. Um, but kind of going back to what I said earlier, just about quality of life, because yeah. these treatments are just so rough on women, and it really affects how much you can enjoy your life while you're on treatment to prevent it from progressing. So I think that would be my number one is just the significant side effects and really thinking through those of if this is a medication we're going to have to take for the rest of our lives, which a lot of these are, um, just truly how that impacts our happiness and the ability to do the things we want to do and spend time with our loved ones. Yeah. So. And Connie, is there a specific example that comes to mind to just kind of help because there's so many different kinds of side effects we've talked about sure. today? Sure. So I think my top one is pain. pain. So pain and sexual function yeah. um, are two that just, you know, pain just, I'm traveling. That's why I'm in my car. So sorry. But pain, literally just walking and, yeah. you know, spending time with my family, literally activities of daily living, nothing major. I'm not going to run a marathon, but I just want to walk up the stairs and take a shower without constantly being reminded yeah. of my cancer as well. Um, that really has a mental impact right. um, and being now 38 years old and the impact this has had on my sexual health and my relationship um, is huge. So that also um, being this young is, yeah. is, is really hard. So. Thank you, Connie. And last but not least, Caitlin here on our Zoom panel, um, definitely wanna hear what your, your thoughts are on a future treatment. As far as future treatment, um, I would love to see um, a medication that can shrink the tumors and the growth. Dr. Gershenson, you were instrumental in sparking that push for patient organizations to help agency and organizations hear from patients. Um, why was this important and what do you feel was accomplished with this meeting? Well, I've, I've always said that my, my best mentors have been the patients and their families. I've learned so much from their life experiences and what they go through, but I don't think most people have really little idea about the, uh, the challenges uh, that, that patients have in their uh, cancer journey. So I think it was really great to just hear the raw emotions from patients and what their concerns were. And uh, I was, I don't think there was anything that was particularly surprising to me, but it was so gratifying to hear it, even though it was, it was a little painful. Um, it was really important for them to be able to uh, have the voice that they did. Dr. Sun, what about you? Did did you learn anything from this meeting that either created a new idea or perhaps cemented your thoughts about the next moves, um, initiatives that need to happen with the community? I think I nothing was incredibly surprising, but again, I think the main takeaway was that we were watching these incredibly brave women bear their souls, um, often, you know, through tears, um, which made it incredibly real um, in different parts of the world, talking about their experiences. And although they were different ages and had different backgrounds, this cancer brings them together with a shared experience that um, is almost like a superpower in a way for these women to be able to hear each other. But even more so for those of us who are in research, it puts a human face, voice, emotions to the numbers we see, to the trials we read about. And it's a, it's a critical reminder 
that one patient has an entire universe of people that this cancer impacts in ways that we still are trying to figure out how to measure. So in helping each one of these patients, maybe with uh, you know access to a clinical trial or potential new treatments down the line or identifying a molecular marker that may be promising for therapeutic benefit, um, it also helps all of their universe of people in helping care for them. So I think that makes it so much more um, powerful and powerful is just almost a, an understatement, but I, I walked away. I know Dr. Gershenson did too. After that, um, after that meeting that day, the, all of the presentations and discussions, it was moving beyond description. So it was incredible. I agree with you. Um, Jane, what about you? Did anything you participated, but from a patient advocacy perspective or from a patient, just because you are and you participated, did anything new um, come or cement um, in your thoughts about kind of our next moves as a community? Uh, yes. So I think I touched on a little bit um, my thoughts in, um, earlier on, on this, but I think you know, it really just shows that there's still a heck of a lot of unmet need. We definitely, you know, we need to have more clinical trials and treatment advances, and that's so important and to improve the survival of this cancer, but also that there's a lot of unmet need in regards to the treatment of side effects that people have with this disease as well, and some of that's because of limitations and what exists and some of that's because of other barriers to care to be able to access and have the information to better deal with them too so I think it was a really good highlight of of the needs in this area and there's a lot of lot of work that we can do to improve um, things across all three areas that I'm sure each of the different stakeholders will be really motivated to work on. And to add what Jane just said, uh, that one major unmet need is the emotional and psychological uh, needs of patients. I think we don't pay nearly enough attention to these. And um, I think a lot more could be done in this area than is, than is currently being done. And as Jane also alluded to, you know, cancer is only one small aspect of a woman's life. They have families, they have friends, they have professions. They, you know, there's so many other uh, aspects to their life uh, that they deal with. That was really my takeaway too. I won't repeat everything that's been said and I agree 100% with everything, but what I really kind of got from that was you saw the impact of this disease in its round, that it's not, you know, it's not just numbers. There are people and they have families and they have careers and they have ambitions and dreams and the impact of this disease on all of those things is quite profound and you I I just you know it just communicated that so strongly that this is the the human face and the collateral of of this disease for all for the women and for the people around them and one of the oh uh, go ahead Charlotte I was going to say one of the things right now that um, all of us can are benefiting from is the power of technology to be able to bring mm -hmm. together people who 20 years ago could not meet in a virtual way and share information and also the researchers as well. And I, I, I want to add what, what I learned from this experience with the, with the FDA meeting, I call it the FDA, log, um, Voices of LGSOC, was the connection that was needed between women that, um, yes, it was wonderful. Um, but allowing women to have a voice and to have a space, they, you know, I think within three days we had received, I don't know, almost a hundred, um, comments and, and, um, registrations. People were so happy to be found. First of all, um, many that I spoke with, had never met anyone with low grade serous ovarian cancer. And then to, we have received amazing um, 
feedback from women saying, I'm so glad I'm not alone. I'm so glad somebody wanted to hear from me. Um, and I'm so glad that my experiences, although horrible, are shared. So that was such a powerful message to me as um, a patient advocate, knowing that um, our work um, is helping um, in so many different areas. So we have learned so much this year. This year has been incredible in our community. And um, all of you here today, I um, thank you for that because you all have put so much effort into um, um, solving the unknown for this disease. And there's a lot of hours and just, I wanna thank you um, for that. Are there any other last minute? Did we not cover anything in particular? Uh, I would just add to anyone who's watched this meeting that the rare ovarian cancer session at last year's World Ovarian Cancer Coalition uh, covered some really relevant points that are still very relevant today. And so if you have watched this and enjoyed this and haven't had an opportunity to see it, then it's definitely worth looking up that session as well. Thank you, Jane. And we'll put the link actually in the chat so that people can, and, and we'll also put the link to the, um, to the FDA voices meeting. Excellent. Thank you. Well, thank you to Dr. Skershenson and son, Jane, Clara, for your participation today and sharing your expertise, your thoughts about the developments in LGSOC this past year. And thank you to everyone who has tuned in to this session. Keep a lookout for continued information on low-grade serous ovarian cancer as our global community continues working together to raise awareness of the need for more focus and investment in low-grade serous ovarian cancer. Thank you.